Welcome to the Living Your Career show, everybody. My name is Roisin Duffy. I'm a, a director of Blue Sky Careers. Uh, we are a recruitment and career advisory agency. The theme of today's show is the art of pivoting in effective career management or career development. And I know the first question many people would ask is, well, what's the difference really between agility and pivoting? Well, if you consider that agility really means that you flexibly or you reactively and quickly respond to any environmental changes, whereas pivoting, on the other hand, means actually taking your knowledge, your skills, your experience, your passion, your values, perhaps taking them from a place where they're underutilized to taking them to a place where they can provide more value and then reaping the rewards of that value. So I would say for job seekers or people who are stuck in a rut out there that you know you desperately need some change. Um, as Chris would say, and you're about to talk to Chris, the difference between pivoting and agility, well, the difference, pivoting really, is about perhaps not going where the wind takes you, but taking actually control of your career and the design of your career, and then allowing things that you possibly hadn't even thought about or conceived, allowing them to happen. And I think with that, I'm going to introduce you to the famous Chris Farrar. Um, Chris is a strategic business leader. He's a policy and governance chair um, and co-chair of various educational boards. Um, Chris has a diverse work history. He's worked in, um, obviously, in higher education right now, transport, local government, and media. He holds a dual role of associate vice president, um, Southeast Queensland, and also Director of Strategic Engagement for CQ University. Um, Chris has an executive MBA. Um, he has studied new venture leadership at MIT Sloan School of Management. And he's also a graduate of the Australian Institute of Company Directors. Chris Farrar, welcome to the show. I know you're a busy man, you have a young family. And I imagine this year has been an incredibly busy one for you with COVID-19 and all the changes in the tertiary sector. So thank you for taking the time to join me on the show today. Thanks for having me, Roger. Pleasure to be here. Oh, thank you so much. I guess the first question really for you, Chris, is when you, and this, is a com this was the first question for pretty much everybody I've interviewed so far on the show. When you started out, did you think to yourself, I've got a career plan, I've got a kind of a career direction. Tell us a little bit about your background and, and how you started and how you've evolved. Yeah, look, that's a really good question. For me, uh, funnily enough, and ironically enough, given the the subject of what we're talking about today, I really had no career design, no career plan when I started out. Uh, I was somebody who hadn't really given much thought throughout my high school years to, to what sort of career I'd be passionate about or, or what I'd excel in. And I left that decision to a very uh, late moment in terms of application to, to university. So at the time I was doing really well in English and uh, a parent said to me, my father said to me, uh, you know, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. And he said, well, you're pretty good at English. Why don't you give uh, journalism a try? And so, you know, with that influence, I just sort of ran with it and, and I went straight into this, uh, this career in, in journalism, first through study and, and then through uh, cadetship at a at a regional newspaper, and that was um, that was a great start. Actually, uh, it was something that built off my natural skills in terms of written and and spoken communication. Uh, it was a job that really exposed me quite quickly to a diverse number of of different skills. So stakeholder engagement, um, liaising with people at all levels of society working with uh, digital technology in, in quite a, an early stage in terms of newspaper layout and things of that nature, even dabbling in things like photography, working in a small regional newspaper environment. So that was a nice kickoff, but it was by no means by design. It was, it was very much flying by the seat of the pants. And it really bears very little resemblance to what I'm doing now and what I've done for the last couple of decades. So short answer, no plan, but the plan has has shaped up over time. It's evolved. You know, we, when we talk about pivoting, we often think of pivoting in terms, in business terms. And, you know, it's really become kind of a common word that I'm hearing from the public servants, even in the private sector, this word, we need to pivot more. We need to be, you know, much more dynamic in what we're doing. I guess, how do you describe pivot in the context of career management? 
I really like the word pivot. It's a really visceral image for me because I'm an old basketball player. So, you know, the, the concept of pivoting is when you grab the ball with both hands and you keep one foot planted on the ground and move the other around to try and find your next move. And that, that's actually quite a fitting metaphor for, for this notion of pivoting. Um, I, I think for me, pivoting, and you've, you've touched on it already, is it's the difference between reactivity and proactivity in your career. So there has been a trend towards talking about agility and businesses and people being agile. Um, and agility to me speaks to this responsiveness to environmental stimuli, if you like. So, so being agile means that you can duck and weave as, as the situation dictates. For me, pivoting is, is about more of a proactive stance. It's about saying, look, I have all this skills, all these experiences, all this knowledge, but where I'm standing right now is not effectively or fully utilizing that, those skills, that knowledge. So pivoting will allow me to take this, this valuable thing I have in my hand and face in a different direction and put those energies into, into a place where they'll be more effectively utilized. And I think you can talk about that in a business sense or you can talk about it in a personal sense. So through COVID-19, uh, I don't know about you, but I've heard a lot about businesses pivoting. And so if I could give a, an example, and I really just made this up in my head about five minutes ago, but I think it's a good example. Let's say you were in uh, a, a business that made formal wear and you made tuxedos and, and formal dresses and that was you know a successful business and and you had a roaring trade with the advent of COVID 19 you know all public events are cancelled for a nine month period so that once thriving business may actually uh, go quite pear-shaped and you might find yourself um, with with very little business um, very little revenue but the skills that you've acquired you might have access to great fabric wholesalers you might have selling expertise, you might have great online sales channels. And if you look at the external environment, you can say, well, actually, I can put that fabric and those sewing skills and those supply channels to good use by making face masks for people who don't like the normal disposable variety and they might like something that's a bit more sophisticated uh, with, with, you know, uh, quality fabrics and sequins and things like that. So that's an example of a business pivoting through a difficult period. Um, by the same token, I think you can apply it to a personal context. Um, and that's whether you're mid-career, that's whether you're job seeking and, and between jobs. I, I think you can actually do a, an, almost an audit of your, your skill set, your expertise set, and say, this is what I've got in my bag of tricks. Uh, the current situation is not necessarily utilising that to its, to its full potential. Where can I take this to not only benefit my employer or my business, but also to, to benefit my career trajectory as well. So it's almost recontextualizing. I mean, I say this to people a lot. When you come to a point where you're not, ha like you love what you do, but where you are, it's, it's almost a bit, you need to change the game. Yes. And I call that recontextualize. So you can either recontextualize and, it, and then on top of recontextualizing, you can actually, as you say, turn in another direction. I'm curious, what was the first point that you enter, that, that you actually implemented the whole point of pivoting. Was it something that was it something that was in the folklore or in the business conversation at the time, or was it just something that you know this recontextualization and stepping in a different direction? Did you just suddenly come to that of your own sort of volition? I actually think my first clear pivot was was only really visible in hindsight. I think at the time. I wasn't aware that that's what I was doing. But if I reflect now, I realize it was actually a pivot. And it actually came quite early in my career. It came um, basically a year into my career. Um, when you are studying journalism and you go into your first job, you, you do this this sort of notion of a one-year cadetship. So you learn the ropes and, and it kind of is your stamp of, of approval as, as being an effective journalist. And I really enjoyed journalism, uh, that sort of mainstream media, newspaper journalism, um, you know, it was an enjoyable job, but it wasn't particularly well remunerated and money's not everything, but, but at the time I could see that this was going to be a long, hard slog to, to sort of build up ahead of steam in terms of um, earning potential. 
And I thought, do I want to stick it out for 10 years and, and go through that? Or do I want to actually see if there's a, a fast track here in terms of where I can take this, this skill set that I've acquired um, through study and on the job training and, and put it to, to use where it might be more highly valued. And so uh, that was actually my pivot into public relations and media relations, where I sat on the other side of the fence in a, in a, in a corporate or government environment and could actually utilise the skills I gained to liaise with the media on those organisations for half. Um, and, and so I, I found that was a clear pivot where I'd taken a, a set of skills that that you know um, that were broadly applicable. You know, the, the, this notion of liaising with the public, um, crafting effective messaging, um, understanding the science of media and, and the timing and, and the, the, the art of the pitch and, and putting that in an environment where it was going to be potentially more highly valued by the employer. And, and I actually haven't looked back from that. Um, it's interesting though, I mean, I think, I think this notion of pivoting, it, it can be a bit of a sliding doors moment. So uh, you never know oh, where, interesting. yeah, you, you never know where your career will end up. And, and look, maybe if I had stuck with traditional journalism, uh, you know, maybe I would have uh, been posted overseas. Maybe I would have written a piece that won a Walkley. Maybe I would have um, found my way into an editor's chair. I, I don't know. You just don't know where that trajectory is going to take you. But I think it's a it's, it's an inflection point and you sort of say, do I go this way? Do I go that way? I've chosen to go another way. And um, and I'm, I'm really satisfied with the career outcome. So I think, um, I think there's no sort of... Um, there's no downside to to not pivoting um, unless you really feel that where you are is a dead end and you're almost forced to to manoeuvre. And I think for people in that situation, I think understanding the art of pivoting is is really critical. I was thinking to myself uh, when we were talking about this earlier, you know, whether there's a particular stage. Where, I mean, I'm thinking in particular the Qantas 2000 sort of, you know, um, operation stuff, you know, the ground handling people, their jobs are being outsourced. This came up yesterday. And look, everywhere is having to trim and slim and run their businesses as they, you know, these are very unprecedented times for us, really. But I would think that was an absolute apt moment for people to actually think about how they can recontextualize and pivot. But I'm mm. wondering whether there are other stages in your career where you had a discernible pivot, one by design, because some people would say moving from journalism into PR would almost be a natural step. Mm. But then let's look at where it wasn't perhaps a natural step, where you needed to be brave and mm. back yourself. So what were those other points? Well, the, the clear one that sticks out for me is the transition from communications management to a more generalist form of management. I, I think I had made that pivot, uh, even if it was more of a natural progression from uh, the, the, the media side of the, the table to the corporate side of the table, um, but effectively utilising the same skill set. And as I went on in that career of, of media relations and external relations, I actually um, started to add management to my, to my cap, if you like. I put that management feather in my cap and, and started managing staff, managing teams. Um, gradually those teams got larger and as you step more away from the practitioner role um, so no longer necessarily spending all of my hours liaising with the media on the front line but maybe um, acting in a more strategic position um, doing more of the air traffic control of, of you know team management um, I found that I gained this skill set which in the best sense of the word was quite generic. Um, it, it was broadly applicable to, to you know, whether that was a communications team, whether that was a, an operations team, whether that was a HR team. It, there are aspects of, of management that are broadly applicable to any context. And so at the time I was in my, my uh, role uh, at CQ University, my current employer, I was the director of corporate communications, managing the university's uh, media, internal communications uh, space, and a vacancy came up within my broader work unit uh, for a director of student experience. And that was a, a role that was responsible for managing uh, admissions to the university, student admissions, managing frontline customer service, managing outreach with schools, managing the provision of student services. 
very foreign concepts to me, apart from the fact that maybe I'd been on the receiving end of those things as a student many years prior. But um, I actually sort of did a little bit of a skills audit and an expertise audit and said to myself, look, I'm looking at this role and I can see that I, I already know the organisation. Uh, I already know the broad managerial skills that will be required to uh, to manage this team of, of people who are subject matter experts and really know what they're doing. Um, so could I take that leap? And I, I had um, the conversation with the person who managed that role and, and said, look, I, I think I'm, I'm ready to take this on and try something new. It was a larger team. It was a more national team. It was a more multifaceted team and uh, applied for that role and, and was successful in obtaining it. And it was a steep learning curve to learn the subject matter, to learn the operations, to learn uh, all the ins and outs of, of that part of the business but it, it was so it, so it was a, a brave move in some ways but to have that existing management expertise um, to apply was was a you know that was that was what I brought with me in my tool bag um, in order to make that pivot and that was that was a role that actually lasted for five years so um, I was I was really happy uh, with that transition and once I got my feet under the table I gained a lot of confidence in in running that role and, and it's something that um, the pivot served me really well. I'm curious, Chris, you know, um, as you're progressing in your career, one of the things that you did prioritize was your education. And I remember when you were doing your um, your executive MBA, um, a QT, and um, I know that you found that, um, I suppose, strategically satisfying, you, you found it satisfying in terms of the connections that you made. I noticed you've gone on to do work with... Um, in the US as well, one of the universities, and you've been studying, I think it's a um, new venture leadership. I mean, I'm just interested to understand for those people who want, well, there's two things. I think if you pivot, you're gonna move quicker probably, but you need to be brave and you need to be able to back yourself. Then the second thing is, how does study support those maneuvers? And how, why did you choose your study and how did it assist you? I, I know you're also obviously a member of the Australian Institute of Company Directors, but I'm particularly thinking about the EMBA, if somebody wants to be a leader of the future, what does that mean to them and how pivoting, how that goes hand in hand with pivoting, your study and pivoting? Mm. No, that's a really good question, Rajin. Oh, look, I, I think education is, is a key to unlocking opportunity and that's a, that's a general feeling that I have. Um, for my own personal context, I've been quite deliberate in the study that I've chosen. Um, working in a university environment, for example, qualifications, qualifications my apologies, are, are very highly favoured, um, particularly when it comes to career advancement. You know, as, as a, a sector that uh, provides qualifications to the market, we obviously value those within our, our staff ranks. So for me, um, it was really important that I get educated to a postgraduate level and uh, and you know, obviously shopped around for, for what might be the, uh, the most uh, interesting and, and useful course and, and ended up with the, the QUT Executive MBA. Um, for me, I think it was about really doubling down on that management skill set and understanding that the MBA would give me a broad sort of toe in the water of, of a, a whole range of different facets of management and things that I wasn't necessarily comfortable with. For example, finance is not uh, is not the strongest, uh, not the strongest um, tool in my tool bag. So having the ability to do a bit of a deep dive on finance was important. Um, dipping into things like HR, dipping into things like innovation, dipping into um, even areas that I had already engaged in, like media relations, but just sharpening uh, sharpening my skills in that area was really important. Um, I think for me as well, the building of a network. Um, beyond the sector I was in was really important. And as somebody who had been educated through the state school system, um, I didn't actually enter the workforce with really strong networks. Um, they were something that I've had to build over time. And coming into that MBA program, I actually found that I was um, not only in a cohort of, of leaders, uh, which, which is great for building just an immediate network, but um, a cohort of leaders from a broad range of industries, whether that was mining, whether that was uh, real estate, whether that was manufacturing, whether that was you know government or, or whatever, and and so it was a an effective way to kind of build this this almost instant network um, of people across industries, and and that was something that that I found really effective 
Um, for me, doing the, the graduate, uh, becoming a graduate of the Australian Institute of Company Directors was a, a similar approach. Um, and, and to be honest, it was also uh, tied in with this concept of the pivot where I could actually say, okay, I've got educational leadership experience. Um, I, I'm, I can apply this elsewhere for the benefit of another organisation and, and how do I bridge that gap from someone with little governance experience to, to actually sort of being able to enter that world. And so the GAICD was, was perfect for that. Um, and it's actually led to some really solid um, board opportunities and, and currently I'm the chair of a, of a, of a committee for a, a large education provider at secondary level and primary level. Um, I'm also co-chair of a, of a small school board. Um, I have been a, a director on the, the QTAC board in, in Queensland, the Queensland Tertiary Admissions Centre. So um, that was just a, a, a level of study that was really a, it was a great course and I'd highly recommend it, but in some ways it was a means to an end to say, okay, how do I bridge the gap between this corporate expertise into government governance expertise? How do I make those two things meet in the middle? And that course was really effective in that regard. And then the MIT Sloan Studies, what, so that's new venture leadership. So I'm just mm. really interested why you selected that and why others would be interested in that as well. Well, that was, uh, that was a, a really interesting one, actually. And it came apart through uh, my, my time at QUT um, doing the MBA. And this is, this is a really great example of how study can broaden your focus and broaden your worldview, um, even if it's not planned. It was very accidental in a way. But QUT Business School really values the, uh, the, the world of business pitching. And I got involved with business pitching as kind of an extracurricular thing. And... Um, I got into a team that was part of the the global. Um, I'm going to I'm going to mess up the the name of it now, but it was a global business challenge. My apologies. And the global Bu business challenge is an international competition held in Brisbane each year. It's sponsored by a number of Queensland universities, and each year uh, postgraduate business students come together to pitch their ideas um, in particular um, industries or, or uh, areas of innovation. And a few years back. I got roped into a team at the very last minute to, to pitch an innovation. Our innovation was about monitoring um, uh, wastewater, which is obviously a, a really topical theme now and something I didn't have any expertise in, but, but you know, something that allowed me to take a really uh, a deep dive into an area that I was unfamiliar with. We ended up winning that global business challenge as a team of three. And that opened opportunities to go and pitch uh, at a, a competition in Thailand, which had a number of Southeast Asian countries participating at. Um, it allowed me to go to Texas in the US to, to pitch in, a, um, in, a, in another pitching competition in the US. And there were teams there from Harvard and MIT and, and places like that. So really high caliber uh, competitors. And, and to, to be part of that and to be part of the first Australian team to, to be at that pitching competition was quite amazing. Um, so I had a little bit of a reputation for this, this notion of business pitching. And when QUT uh, in, in Brisbane was able to host MIT for their um, inaugural New Ventures leadership course, um, I was tapped on the shoulder for a, a half scholarship to say, would you like to take part in this? And I thought, well, to study with MIT in my hometown in, a, in an area of innovation is obviously an opportunity too good to refuse. So sometimes these things are just very opportunistic and, you know, um, opportunities can fall in your lap and you can capitalise on them. And that, that bit of study probably wasn't part of this master plan of, of building my, um, my repertoire or, or my set of qualifications, but it was a nice happy accident and something that was, uh, was quite an amazing experience actually. I think what you're saying is that if you take the steps, then you don't know where they lead you, but they will certainly mm. very likely lead you to opportunity if you back yourself. That's what I'm hearing. Well, you, know, think... you need to be bold. Um, I'm curious, Chris, the COVID-19 situation, which of course everybody's immersed in right now, good, bad or indifferent, has that given you opportunity to pivot? It has. Uh, well, I actually don't know if it's allowed me to pivot. It's probably allowed me to be agile. And so I'm... You know, and I think it's important to have both uh, both skills in your in your repertoire. You can't always constantly pivot. I, I think you know there are some times when the external environmental factors impact you, and you have to sink or swim. So for me, working in higher education, COVID has been 
um, obviously a huge disruptor for our industry this year because uh, Australia um, is is such a, a a dominant player in the international education space. And international education, uh, maybe not this year, but in, in years past, is actually the third biggest export industry we have here. And, and people don't necessarily realize that. Um, so it's hugely lucrative, but it's also hugely important for global relations. It's, it's just a really important industry. And um, with the closure of borders during COVID, that has obviously stopped the supply of, of customers or, or split students um, short and, and uh, has, has brought that part of the education sector to a grinding halt. So for businesses like mine or, or institutions like mine, we've actually had to be quite pragmatic. And um, I'm really proud of CQ University being a first mover in this space where we've actually gone, you know what, this is going to be a direct hit to our bottom line. Um, we need to adjust and, and right size our organization and get back on track to something that's a little bit more sustainable. And so we took that pain very early in the piece, you know, even back in April, which was looking back really the early days of COVID, even before the first wave was really taking hold in Australia. And, um, and so we, we sort of really overhauled our, our structure internally and made some quite drastic cost savings. And we've moved past that, but on a personal level, uh, I was approached by, by our vice chancellor, who's now my, my direct supervisor, um, to say, look, you're doing a great job in, in your current role, but we need to shuffle some people around. And we actually want to take advantage of your skill set in the communications and media space and apply that to a new area we're building um, called uh, strategic engagement. And strategic engagement encompasses the university's media and internal communications and general communications activities. It also encompasses philanthropy and fundraising, and it encompasses stakeholder um, and alumni relations. Um, we're also looking for a head of our Brisbane campus. Do you think you could do both roles? And uh, obviously, <laughs> in, in the midst of COVID, I think any job offer is a good one. Um, but for me, it's actually been a really positive move. I've been able to capitalize on a skill set that I've built up over time, but haven't really utilized in, in say, five years and come back into that realm with a whole lot of new knowledge and a whole lot of new skills that I can apply to this context. So I've actually come from managing a, a team of uh, about 150 people who are located across five different states. Um, that level of, you know, across multiple business units and that level of operational complexity is really serving me well in this new role where I've actually got a smaller team um, I've probably got a, an equally broad focus, but it's a smaller team. We're doing more with less. And I've been able to actually go, okay, how can I tap into the knowledge I have about working efficiently and, and um, leveraging greater capacity out of staff and, and building positive relations across you know, geographic locations and things like that. So it, it, I've taken all of this knowledge of the past five years and plowed it back into a role that is quite similar to a role I've done before. And, and so that's been really interesting and exciting to see how that's played out. And I've also had the benefit of reflection. So I've you know, spent the last five years observing the trends in media, the, the downsizing of mainstream and traditional media, the, um, the rise of social media and, and the individual becoming a broadcaster and a media personality in their own right and saying, okay, how can we apply this to, you know, to a communications lens um, within a corporation or a university? Something that I might not have had the perspective of detachment um, had I been in the throes of, of a communications role for the past five years. So I actually think it's been um, a really, it's been a, an, an agility move, an agile move, but it's been something that has, has been quite refreshing and something that I, I'm, I'm really embracing at the moment. Chris, I need to wrap up, but I've got one question and I need you to, you've got about 30 seconds to answer this. <laughs> a question. If you were giving a piece of advice to anybody now, it's COVID-19, you know, many people are devastated by what's happening. They're either stuck in jobs that they don't love or don't have jobs, or they need to, you know, pivot, recontextualize, or adapt, one or the other. If you had one sentence and one piece of advice you could give them, what would it be? I think if you're looking for work, uh, if you're on SEEK or you're on one of these job platforms, you need to look beyond the headline. Don't look at the role title, delve into the description, and get a, a stronger sense. Don't just dismiss a job ad on the basis of what the position title is. You might find in the fine print 
that even if the job title doesn't match your skill set or your expertise set at all, you may actually find in the fine print there is a, a way for you to apply what the role requires to your own context and actually be a really um, effective applicant. So I, I would just say dig a little deeper and, and look for those opportunities below the surface and also get some good professional advice. Chris Farrar, you're a gentleman. Thank you so much for sharing your time, your knowledge, your wisdom. Um, yeah, absolutely fantastic. Uh, to everybody else who's watching, this is the Living Your Career show. Um, I'm obviously Roisin Duffy. Uh, we uh, go to air every Tuesday and Thursday at uh, 12 noon Brisbane time. Um, please keep learning, keep loving, keep living your career because it's important. And for now, I'll just simply say goodbye to everybody. Thank you very much. And thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roisin.